Most people believe the Holy Spirit exists. But why don't we ever talk about it? We hear about the Holy Spirit and we sing about the Holy Spirit, but do we understand who He is? The Holy Spirit is not meant to be a mystery. He is a person and not an it. The Holy Spirit isn't just a power source to tap into when we need it. It's about communion with the person. There are many aspects of the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism with the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit. And the truth of who He is is painted throughout the Bible. The Holy Spirit is meant to be a part of our everyday lives. And we are called to live in the supernatural. Well, we're going to continue our Yet For Us, Ignited by the Holy Spirit series. This is week four. Anybody having a good time on the past three weeks? Okay, you should have been having a great time. Uh, we've talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about an introduction to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I know last week in particular for me, I was so just stirred and motivated that, man, I, God, I want these things operating in my life because people need help, right? I want you to get glory, God, and I want people to get help. So let every gift you have flow through me in your proper timing. Can we do this like we've been doing every week? Can we stand together and read 1 Corinthians five or 8, 5, and 6? Let's do that all together here. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. This is what I believe and what I stand on by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, we are going to jump in today in our series on prophecy. And we figured that, hey, to do this, let's call in somebody who's been ministering in the prophetic among us since the 90s. So that's before a lot of the college students were even born. So before you were born... Joe and Yvonne Ewan have been ministering among us, and they're here this morning. Hold on one second. Let me say a couple things about them, then you can cheer for them a little more. Come on, guys. They're not only our friends, which they are. Amen. They have a great accent. Amen. But they have, you know, I would say, you guys, they've sacrificed a lot. Uh, coming here once or twice a year, every year, to love on everyone in our training school, go to life groups and minister to people, individually minister to people, speak at conferences, you know, so many things. I just, I'm very appreciative of their sacrifice. Uh, they also serve on our board of advisors. And also during the pandemic, these last two years, when they weren't able to travel here in person, they have been laboring in intercession for you. Seriously, Antioch Waco, by name, lots of time, bringing us before God's throne so that we would have wisdom from God of how to navigate the challenging times and find victory in Jesus Christ. So thank you guys. Can't wait. God bless you. Bless thank you, you too. Yeah. All right, Amanda. Well, it really is a joy to be with you over today <laughs> over a bit. <laughs> Um, to be back here again and just to be and to connect again with the people that we've connected with over many years and also to make fresh connections here. Um, Antioch has been a great support to our churches back home and, you know, in the offering Jeff mentioned and the mission abroad and our church at home is the recipient of six people at the, currently who are on three year serve projects and I can't tell you what a blessing they are to us Amen. it's just amazing and <clears throat> they are getting embroiled in Scottish culture learning to talk the way we talk I'm talking properly for your benefit um, but they are learning all sorts of new terminology uh, you won't be able to understand them when they get back but also, we are, had a Thanksgiving dinner, thanks to them, and learned all the history of 
why you have a Thanksgiving dinner in the States. So we are getting more uh, American culture too. But, you know, I just want to share the love of the people from our church at home. It's um, churches. churches. We've got three of them. We are based in the Banff one mostly, which is a very small town. It's an Antioch outpost, if you like, in the north of Scotland, yeah. in a small town with 4,000 people. <clears throat> but, you know, as Jeff said, when we left here in March 2020, we thought we were coming back in September again. But, you know, sometimes our plans get disrupted, but the Lord orders our steps. And in the meantime, we've been investing at home, and I can't tell you, we've seen God moving. During COVID, we've had stricter lockdowns than you've had here in the States, but yet the church has grown. That's been the amazing thing. There's been a spiritual you, hunger awakened in people that hasn't been there before. And the church has been awakened. There's been a desire, a new desire to actually step out. And people who've been Christians for a long time are feeling that stirring as well and seeking to grow and develop in the Lord. And for myself, I'm at that stage too. I was just saying in the other service, you know, I'm not exactly in the first flush of youth. And I remember when I was baptized in the oh, Holy yes, Spirit. Oh, yes, you are. And, <laughs> in my 20s. But, you know, it's different now. I want to keep growing. I want to be able to... I don't want to see a young generation doing it all and us to be left on the sidelines, you know, cheering them on. I want to be in there. So we all need to get in on the flow. You're going to preach. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... I shall leave it there. No, no, carry on, <laughs> carry on. I've lost the thread now. <laughs> you want to be in? Yeah, I want to be in on the flow. Do you not want to be in on the flow of what God's doing? You know, these are exciting days that we're living in. We have seen someone had an encounter with God in our small community whose life has been transformed. He was miraculously delivered on moment. his own in a moment. From depression. From depression and alcoholism. alcoholism and all sorts of different things. And just his life completely turned around. We used to think that only people in Muslim countries had encounters like that. You know, the man in white coming to see him. We're beginning to see that in Scotland. Can you Come imagine on. it? So, okay, I mean, Europe was now. considered the hard place. Europe was considered the difficult continent. But God is moving in Europe today. Amen. I'm going now. You're going now? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Could I have that time back, you know? That's what your politician says. Could I have that? No, anyway. <laughs> hey, it is. It's really great to be with you. Could you believe I've lived with that woman for 50 years this year? <laughs> I mean. So keep praying for her. Hallelujah. What a joy to be back here again and a joy to be um, partnering once more. You know, someone asked me in November when I was here, um, you know, when, did you la when were you last here? And I was, oh, it was two years ago. And then I just stopped for a moment and said, no, I was here two days ago before I came because in the Holy Spirit, I was on this campus praying for you. And, you know, because we need one another. And we're called, oh, thank you for the encouragement. Your enthusiasm overwhelms me this morning. Amen? We need one another. Amen. amen. Did I hear someone in the back row say amen? Yeah, amen. 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 Go for it. I'll, well, I'll love them up there hey, and down here. But, hey, we need one another because we're living in the greatest days of the church. Amen? Because God is moving. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Uh, get the Botox on. I'm going to give you some Botox today. <laughs> Spiritual Botox. Get rid of the wrinkles. Amen? It's all in here, and he wants us to be using his word. So, so I'm going to talk to you some foundational things. Prophecy 101. Why should I prophesy would be the title. And we're going to lay a foundation this morning. 
on prophecy. So we're going to look at Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29, very familiar verse, verses here. And Joel says this, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions, still see in visions. Thank you, Jesus. And also among the men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. It shall come to pass afterwards, he said. When did that happen? That happened on the day of Pentecost, on, on the day of Pentecost, that after, it'll come to pass afterwards, after that day, that's what he was prophesying. He's looking down through the corridors of time, and he sees a day coming when there's an outpouring of God going to happen. Amen? And then if you turn with me to Acts chapter 2, you'll see it on the screen, verse 17 and 18. And it says this, what happened was Peter gets hold of this word of Joel, and on the day of Pentecost, he starts to speak it again, but it's different. He was called, Peter was called a disciple, and who discipled him? Who prepared him for the day of Pentecost? Oh, yeah, but he was a failure. He was a loudmouth. He was a fisherman. He was this. He was that. Well, okay, but God had prepared him for such a time as this. And what he does, he's looking now. He's taken the word of Joel, and, and he says this, it shall come to pass in the last days. And here we are. Here we are, and this is what he says. God will pour out his spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men, men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And then it says, and they shall prophesy. So Joel only spoke, uh, said prophecy once, but Peter emphasized it a second time. And when God emphasizes through the word something a second time, there's something that's about to happen in the last days. Your day and my day, amen? We're nearer than when we first believed. So can I ask you, you know, we, we, we listened to a song there, um, at just an amazing times of worship today. Just, oh, blew me away. Just so so filled up with God already because of being able to worship Him. Amen? And, you know, it spoke there a day coming where we would bow before the Lord. Can I ask you today? You see, it's today if you hear His voice. Don't, don't harden your heart as they did in the wilderness. That's Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Don't harden your heart. But let your heart bow before the Lord right now. And let's, let me pray for you. Father God, I want to thank you for hearts that are open in these last days. I thank you, Lord, for a people you're preparing and have prepared. And I thank you, Lord, we're here for such a time as this. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to embrace your word and to step out into all that you're calling us to in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it says here, that the angel said to me, to John, um, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Anybody going there? Oh, hallelujah. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you don't do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Now, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I'm not a theologian. I was a fisherman. I, I laid down my nets to follow Jesus. I literally did that uh, back in many years ago now. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, but I just got this simplicity of seeking to understand the Word. So where does Jesus live today? Show me. Here. He lives in here. So if Jesus lives in there, where's his testimony? In here. So what hindereth thou from prophesying? Anyway. 
Because you catch this next scripture, and we're all going to read it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and it is verse 31. Come, join with me in this one. One, two, three. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Now, just let that sink in. What you know what that's saying to you? Thus saith the Lord, if you like, no excuses. No excuses. You got to do it. You got to reach out. So why should we prophesy? Well, number one, you need it. Do you need it up the back? Yeah, they need it up the back. I'm supposed to hear an amen. amen. Now, if it was Scotland, it would be amen. But if it's Texas, it's amen. Come on, let me hear it. Let me hear that amen. Come on. Candy, let me hear it. That's it. That's it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, you know, we need it. The church needs it. Doesn't it? That should be even louder. The church needs the prophetic word in these days. Amen. The nation needs it. I don't know why you're not on top of your chair screaming that one. The nation needs it. Listen, oh, you think your nation's bad. My nation needs it too. Let me tell you, pray for us in Britain because we need it. And the nations of the world need the word of God. Amen. I remember a time I was with a guy called John Paul Jackson. He's in heaven now, a great prophetic leader he was. And I was in Poland with him on a team, just serving him and serving the ministry. And, and we were in this one particular city for a few days. And um, <clears throat> we were just ministering and listening to his teaching and stuff. And then one night I was sitting at dinner, and, and uh, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you to go buy five loaves. Now, I've learned not to ask God questions at a moment like that. In other words, argue with the Lord. Just go do what he tells you to do, you know? So I went to buy these five loaves. So I ended up with a sack of, because Polish bread is big. And I've got this big sack of loaves. So I come back into the restaurant. I put it down underneath my chair, and everybody's looking. He said, oh, he must be hungry tonight. <laughs> and so anyway, I finished my dinner, and we all went to the meeting, and I went with Bible and five loaves. And so I took the loaves, put them underneath the chair, and we're worshiping God and, and um, just seeking to be obedient to him. And John Paul Jackson walked in, he walked up to me, and he said, hey, he said, I don't have a word for this evening. He said, do you have one? And I just looked at him. I said, no, but I've got five loaves. <laughs> and I picked up the five loaves. Then God spoke. And he said, Poland has eaten the crumbs of Europe and Russia for 70 years, and the Lord now wants to restore the children's bread. And that is the bread of healing. I don't know what happened with that word after that. All I had to do was deliver it on the day. We were breaking bread with Catholic believers. We, I mean, they were stage diving. They were jumping all over the place. I mean, they were just... It just all went crazy. How do we go at the stage driving too? But praise the Lord, I'm still alive. Anyway, you know, the nations need the Word of God. And if we're carrying the Word of God, we need to be those that are willing to go and do what God's called us to do. Amen? And that is to take the prophetic Word. Listen to this very serious scripture that's going to come up on the screen. It's in Numbers 11, verse 25, and it says this, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, that's Moses, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But look what it says in the end. But they did not continue doing it. Could it be if these elders had continued to prophesy that Israel didn't need to stay in a wilderness for 40 years? Could it be that they ended up in that dry place a place of rebellion in their own hearts because they weren't hearing the prophetic word. It wasn't being spoken to them. They didn't have the faith to believe God, yet they were being miraculously provided for, but yet they were in a wilderness. 
We needed, we need God to come, but they didn't continue to do it. And we have been uh, commissioned by the Lord to be a prophetic people in our day. Yeah, three of you. Oh, I'll get your enthusiasm going yet. Hallelujah. Maybe it's my accent. I always remember one of the first times I came here, there was, you know, we were up in the, in, in, in the um, what do you call it, you know, where they do all the rodeos up there, and, and, we're, and there's this little old lady, and she's standing looking at me like this, and I says, can I help you, ma'am? She said, no, you just keep talking, because I love your accent. <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to prophecy. So what will prophecy do for you? What does it, it do for you? Um, well, the first thing it does, it reveals the love of God for the body of Christ. Because Jesus loves his body. Jesus loves the church. The fa Father God is giving the church to Jesus as his bride. Without spot or wrinkle. Amen. There's a day, I don't think he's coming back today because I think there's still a few wrinkles and a few spots that need to be dealt with. We need to go to the beautician, the, the beautician of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in it to get rid of our wrinkles. Oh, I'm preaching, not teaching. Anyway, um, and, and so it reveals the love of God for the body of Christ. I tell the story of my daughter when she got married, Leslie. Uh, Yvonne and, and my other daughter, they were away to the church already, and dad and his daughter standing there as we're preparing to, to, for the wedding ceremony. And I'm looking at Leslie that day, and I said, hey, honey, that girl will come in to give, do your hair up today. I mean, I think she was drunk. Could you go fix it before we get down the road? And, you know, and the one that came in after her to do the makeup, I think you should go fix your eyes. I mean, she was on drugs, definitely. You know, and then I'm looking at the dress she bought. I mean, I paid good money for that dress, you know, and I'm a Scotsman, you, see, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, I said, hey, listen, listen, could you not have bought a better dress than that? What kind of wedding do you think we would have had? What kind of wedding do you think we're going to have to Jesus if we keep pulling the church down instead of building her up? We had a great wedding. We had a great time. So the days, the days of pulling the church down are over. And we need to be those that are encouraging the church. What the Bible tells us and how we encourage the church is through prophecy. It says here in 1 Corinthians 14, not verse 1, Jimmy spoke about it last week. Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Amen? It doesn't mean to say the other gifts are void in any way. We need them all working in our hearts and in our lives. But he wants us to be prophesying. He wants us to be declaring the love of God. Lauren Samford in his book on prophecy says this, if the modern church walks in powerlessness, it's not because we hold too little faith. It's because we don't have enough love. We don't have enough love, if you want to say it that way. You know, we need the love of God. And the Bible, with no excuse, because the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Amen? You have the love of God because you've got Jesus living inside you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside you. You've got gifts of the Holy Spirit. We just need to activate them and be motivated and to do what God's called us to do in these days. Now, that should be a loud amen. 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 And we're to pursue love. That's, um, you know, that word pursue, it means to follow and to press hard after. It's like the hunter, you guys know this, that the hunter pursues his prey. Amen? Or as the lady pursues the dress or the new shoes. You know, what? or the guy pursues a Mercedes or whatever it is that you're looking for. You know, it's, it says we pursue, we're after the things that God wants for us. Amen? That may include a new dress, ladies, don't worry. Um, anyway, I was, we were in YWAM back in, in 1979 before a lot of you were born. And... Um, 
you know, it was typical. We were doing the DTS, a discipleship training school back then. We're in the south of England, and we'd hardly ever been out of Scotland by that time. I had a very, very thick accent then. Jimmy Seibert sorted that out for me. Um, he'd given me elocution lessons, you know, through the years. Um, and, um, but anyway, that was supposed to be funny as well. <laughs> Yvonne, laugh louder, will you? Um, <clears throat> and... And so here we are in this school, and then they said we're sending the prophet in tonight amongst the students. You know, that's one of those da-da-da-da moments. And so I'll tell you, I confessed every sin, because these prophets, we were told to come in and they tell you what sins you've done and this, that, and the other. I was nicer to Yvonne that day than ever, you know. I repented a thousand times, and in comes a prophet, and we're all standing, we're back to the wall, and this guy, he walks up to me, and, and he, he said, have you ever prophesied? I said, no. He said, why? And I'm, I'm just a good little Presbyterian from Scotland. <laughs> I felt like saying to him, hey, John, he was taller than me, John, John Knox is dead. We left all that stuff behind us. I'm a Presbyterian. And then he laid hands on me, and I fell on the ground. 1970, I was before Toronto, before any of these things that were going on, before Antioch and all that stuff, you know. And I'm lying on the floor, and he looks at me. He said, when I tell you, you will prophesy. I said, oh, my goodness me. So there was a few Pentecostals in a town not far from us. So I'd kind of heard them a little bit, you know. So I'm sitting there on the floor. I says, well, at least I could make it sound spiritual, you know. Put a little intonation, thus saith God, you know. Just a yes, you know. Jesus, you know, just really, really get it. I mean, Margie's right with me. And, and, you know, just really get it going there, you know. But nothing was working. But then all of a sudden, from the other side of the room, he said, right, you get over here and prophesy over this guy. Well, I did. I laid hands on him, and the Lord gave me a word for him. And people say to me all the time, I don't know how it is that you can do what you do. How is it that you do what you do? And I said, well, a guy called me out and laid hands on me, and I started to prophesy in September 1979, and I've never stopped doing it since. Because the more you give, the more you receive. Amen? Amen. And so we have to give out of who we are and who God has called us to be. And we're to desire, we're to desire the spiritual gifts. You know, that desire, that burning fire within, desire means to have zeal or to be zealous towards. Sorry, it's not Webster's, but this is what the English dictionary says. Feeling or emotions directed to attainment or possession of something expected to give pleasure or satisfaction. To long for, to crave, to wish, to ask for, to pray, and to entreat, and to command, to lay hold of all that God has for you in your life to be what he's called you to be, that we would be a prophetic people. Bill Johnson said this in his book, um, When Heaven Touches Earth. If we never become a people of desire, we will never accurately or effectively represent Jesus on the earth. Is there a desire in your heart today? Amen. I'm looking for a new generation. I'm 74, soon be 74 years old. We're looking for a new generation to rise up. Amen. And listen, a new generation's got nothing to do with age. Amen. It's got to do with fire and desire within our hearts and within our lives, Margie. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. I can hear that. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Listen to this scripture. I love this scripture, don't you? Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes a heart sick. Sometimes we just stop there. But look what it says. But when the desire comes, there's a tree of life that starts to grow within you. Amen? The tree of life begins to grow. The branches go out. You begin to have life. And the promise is life and life in all its fullness. Amen? Amen. But we've got to reach out for it, to lay hold to all that God has for us. Oh, I've just preached myself happy. Shaka Oh, I better watch what I'm doing here. So pursue love. 
number one. Number two is, it's, it's for, we find here in, in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, verse three, he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Amen? Are you gonna prophesy? This is what, this is the, this is the starting line for anyone in prophetic ministry. Amen? So to edify, to build the church up. It comes from a, a Greek word, edification comes from a Greek word, okodomi, which means to build, a, to, the act of building a structure. It's not the days to be pulling the church down. It's days to be building the church up. Amen. We're all called to build. I mean, you are so privileged to have Jimmy Seibert, to have uh, you know, and you've got all these preachers, you know, you, you've got um, who else? Mick Murray. I mean, it's intimidating to stand here just coming behind them. And, and, and you know, you've got Mr. Quirky, um, what's his name again? Drew Stedman. I mean, you know, the, the theological geek. That's what he calls himself, the theological. I hope he's listening now. Um, he was here the first service. But, you know, you've got all these great men of God leading you and the desire in their heart for us all to move on together. Just grab hold of that desire and let's keep going because there's so much that God wants us to do. To edify means to strengthen and to build up. The word is used here, edification or, or, or edify, seven times in 1 Corinthians 14 on its own. Seven times. God is trying to emphasize something to the church in these days. Amen. Up the back. Come here. Amen. I heard that. Yeah. Amen. So, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 12, even so you, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Prophecy will not leave the church feeling confused degraded or condemned. It will not make people feel inferior or intimidated. It's to bring God's people into a stronger relationship with Him. Amen. 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 The gift's not to promote our own ministries. It's the testimony of Jesus. Yeah. Tell you the story of this. Uh, I was in a training school here, and there was this young lady in the training school and she'd been, I don't know if she'd listen in this service or when, what, what she'll be listening to, but she was going to be listening today. And, um, um, and I would have called her back there a little bit of a rebel, but now she's royalty. But anyway, she was having a rebellious moment before she came to the training school. Joe Ewan, <laughs> prophecy. Lord, I don't know if I believe in that stuff. And she's going on, you see, and, and she tells it better than me. Um, and uh, um, she said, I'm going to go to that school today. And if you don't call my name out and give me a word, Lord, then I'm not going back. That was her attitude. And so I'm in this, in this training school and worship's going on and stuff. And, and I said, Lord, how do I begin? What, what do we? He said, I want you to call out Jenny. Call out Jenny. So I said, is Jenny in the room? Is Jenny here? And people turned and pointed into the corner of the downstairs the, 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 the room over there at the offices, the underground. And there was Jenny curled up in the fetal position. Well, I went over and I picked her up and I started to walk around the room with her in my arms. And I took her head and I put it next to my heart. And I said, the Lord wants you to hear his heartbeat. Let me represent Father God to you today. And he's, because his heart is beating for you and there's things that he has for you. Change their life. One little word of encouragement changed their life. Jenny and Scott McBrayer served the Lord in, in, in Paris and doing a great work today. She'll maybe write it in our, our next newsletter and tell you the full story. But hey, a word, one little word can change your life. I could tell you about Ronnie. I used to travel a lot to India back in the 80s before I was coming here. Um, and 
um, I was in central India, and there was this little boy, and he was there to look after me. I never knew that he slept outside the hotel room door, if you could call it a hotel. Anyway, um, and, and, and he would sleep there all night just to guard me from um, situations that could have happened. And, you know, we're traveling along, along in a bus one day, a van, and, and um, you know, I looked at Ronnie and I said, don't you let the fact that you're, you don't have a formal education stop you from becoming the great man of God that God's called you to be. Because you're called to be a great man of God. And all you have to do is, is submit to your leaders and follow through what they say, and we're going to see something great in your life. Anyway, Ronnie is still leading from between 500 to 1,000 churches in central India. He took the word seriously. He took hold of what God had for him, and he kept going in it. Now, I could tell you a lot more about Ronnie. He was in a road accident, lost his leg. He died, and Jesus sent him back. I mean, it's an incredible story, but he's still doing what God called him to do because God is a God of faithfulness. Listen to what Acts says, Acts chapter 15, verse 30 to 32. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. Oh, Antioch. Give me a wave at the back there again. Yeah, good. <laughs> we're in Antioch, right? And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many other words. So they delivered Paul's letter that's become part of the scriptures and behind that they're prophesying as well the things that God wants to say to get the people encouraged to the place that they're stirred up in their lives. Point number three is to exhort the church or to stir the church up into what God's called the church to be. We need to be stirred up today. Amen? God wants to stir, stir our hearts into what he's called us to be and what he's called us to do. The, the word exhortation comes from a Greek word, parakalesis, which means to exhort and to encourage. It's related to the word paraclete, the word that Jesus used to describe Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's living within you right now. The Bible says this in, in Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, excuse me. The Holy Spirit explicitly says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the wilderness. When's today? Right now. Don't harden your heart wherever you are, but keep your heart open to let God work and anoint you in a fresh and a new way. Let him awaken you in a fresh and a new way for the more that God wants to do in and through your life in this season. Oh, I've preached myself happy. I could jump off a doll's house, you know? I mean, it's just that God is so good, isn't he? Amen. Oh, how, what is it that students say? It's bus, is it? Bus, bussing? Oh. I just want to tell you that it's bussing. Come on. We're going to go for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I've been learning a few things. You know, that word parakalesis can be translated like this in the Bible, I beseech you. I beseech you. He's not going to twist your arm. He's always going to encourage you to come. Come and do what he's called you to do in these days. Amen? Amen. It's for exhortation. It stirs the church into action. The right word at the right time can release, see a release of God's blessing through what God has to say to us prophetically. It will produce reassurance. It will inspire and release God's people into thanksgiving. Amen? It'll cause faith to grow and the congregation will have a greater sense of well-being. That well-being is God is with us. God is with us. Everything can be against us, but God is with us. Amen? We can trust God for what he wants to do. Graham Cook, the famous prophetic guy from England, said this as a golden rule in times of discouragement, 
release the prophetic amongst the congregation or send for the prophet. We're coming to your life group over this next season. All the prophetic people in this church and stuff, we're, I'm, I'm here to help stir them up, and we're going to be coming into your life groups, and we're going to get you. Amen. We're going to get you because it's so important that we're able to do that and you get stirred up and we get stirred up. The church gets built and Jesus can come back. That's called, that's called, that's called spiritual Botox today. I've just, and that's bussing too. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And it's for the comfort of men. You see, it's for the comfort of men. Now, I'm not talking, oh, kind of comfort. You've had plenty of that in the last two years. Now we're out of that, and we're growing up, and we're doing things differently again. <laughs> Amen. 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 I've got, I'm going to pray for you at the end. You're very encouraging. Anyway, so it says, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, he who prophesies for edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Comfort there means to cheer the church up, to get the church stirred up again, and, 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 and for the joy of the Lord to be with strength in the midst of discouragements that have been. Another Graham Cook quote, I believe strongly, he says, that the more encouraging, exhorting, and comforting prophecy we have, the better our churches can be. Blessing and encouragement stir up the anointing. It stirs up the anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One. We just need it to be stirred up. Oh, but I've retired. No, you haven't. You're just being refired. Amen. He's refiring you. He's getting you back into the heart of all that he wants to do in this season that we'll, oh, I'm chilling you. I'm stirred up now. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I was, we have a church in a place called Elgin, not Elgin, that sounds very alcoholic here, but you know, um, it's Elgin in, in Scotland, um, and, and that's 45 minutes away from where we live. So we were there, and we were preaching, and coming home in the afternoon, then there's a diversion. And I'm thinking, oh, I just needed to get home, I need my nap, and, you know, and we get home, and the phone rings to find out that there had been a road accident. And my aunt had been killed in the road accident. And we found out that my cousin was there in the car with her, and she was in the ICU. And I remember Yvonne and I went to the I ICU to see her. She was, she was half in, half out consciousness, obviously racked with pain. And she was a lay preacher in the Methodist church. And I remember saying this to her, you're going to live and not die, and you're going to continue to preach. I'm saying that to someone on the screen today. You're going to live and not die, and you are going to continue to preach. Amen. In Jesus' name. We never saw her again until after she came out of hospital, and I said, do you remember us being to see you in hospital? She says, no, but the only thing I remember at that time in the ICU was the words that I would live and not die, and I would continue to preach. It's that word, that comforting word, that word with strength that was able to keep her going and bring her through to a place of life, and she's still preaching today. You know, you maybe know these names, Judy and Bob Hartsock. Well, I was one day, I was one day, I was in, in well, it was one of the times I was up there in, in, in um, Oklahoma, and I was getting ready to go to the plane, and I'm pretty focused about going home by this time, because it had been a long trip. And I just, we were having lunch, and we were running a little bit late, because some guy had been prophesying or something, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so we're eating lunch, and then all of a sudden, Judy came in. She said, I need you to come with me. And I said, I'm going to wait to the airplane. Oh, she said, I've got someone in hospital. Tried to take their own life. And I just needed to come and pray for them. I said, what? I said, I don't know. She said, I know a shortcut to the airport. I said, well, this has got to be quick. So we drove, and the angels were on the car. Um, we drove to the hospital, and she kept the car running at the front door. I ran into this hospital, found this room, and there's this woman coming to us, and her husband looking very sad alongside her. And I remember I walked in, and I said, hey, I rebuke the spirit of death over your life. You will never do that again. God will come. God is going to raise you up, and your testimony is going to be a ministry to so many. 
got out of that hospital, and away I went. Just tapped the, the husband on the shoulder. Well, you know, I learned later that this lady rose up. I don't know how she heard the word because she was comatose, but she heard the word, and it brought life to her. Because that's what the prophetic word is supposed to do, to bring life, and life in all its fullness. Amen? And this little lady, apparently, every time I went to Norman, she used to come and sit behind me just to pray for me because of what God did in her life. Now, we're great friends, and she actually came on a mission trip to Scotland, and just an amazing story to see what God is doing. Amen? You see, that word comfort comes from two Latin words, the word cum, that means with, and the word fortis, which means strength. And it means the word of God coming with strength. It's not a weak thing. It's a strong thing. Amen? And God wants us to be those that are able to do that in these days, to bring words of strength. You've all heard of this lady, um, no doubt, Amy Carmichael, the Irish missionary that left the shores of Ireland and she said to her family as they were seeing her onto the boat, now I won't be back, I won't be home on furloughs, I'm called of God to go to India and I'll be there for the rest of my life. She went to South India and by the end of her life they used to take her out, she had curvature of the, of, of the spine, apparently they used to carry her out to, so that she could prop her up so that she could preach. Her prayer is this, was this, give me a love that leads the way. Give me a hope that COVID, no, let me put, I would love, but COVID can't dismay. Give me a hope that nothing can dismay. Give me a faith that no disappointment tire and a passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod, but make me thy fuel, O flame of God. This is what she says about comfort. God is with us to make us strong. Comfort is not soft, weakening commiseration. It is true, strengthening love. We've come full circle. Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts. And as you operate in these spiritual gifts, the only way you can do it is in the love of God. There's a story of, uh, in, in the Bible, you know, if the Holy Spirit lives within you, I believe all nine gifts are inside here to be employed as the Lord wants them to be employed. And we see that in Acts chapter 9. There's this guy, this disciple called Ananias. And God comes to us, comes to him, calls his name. I want you to go to the street called Straight. I want you to go to Judas's house. In there, you're going to find one called Saul of Tarsus. He's praying, and he sees a man called Ananias coming to the house, and he's going to speak to him and help him. That's a reviled version. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Ananias says, oh, wait a minute, Lord. This guy's been arresting Christians and taking them away. Now, Ananias was one any disciple, according to my friend, um, um, Kendall Lachlan. He said that he was like an apostle to the church then, and he would have been the leader of that church in Damascus. So he would have been first on Paul's list, Saul of Tarsus's list, to be arrested. Anyway, he, he, here he is, and, uh, and Ananias is not very keen to go, you see. Um, but God just cuts through emotion, hear that? He cuts through emotion, and what he tends to say is, just go and get going. Just go and do what I called you to do. So he, he goes, you see, and um, he's there, and, and I do this exercise with the training schools. How many words of knowledge and how many gifts of the Spirit did it take um, for Ananias to use to get Saul of Tarsus into his ministry and to become Paul the Apostle. I'll help you out this morning because you look a bit tired today. <laughs> Smile back at me. Now, depending on your translation, there was eight or nine words of knowledge. There was the gifts of healings and miracles. There was the gift of faith, because I would have needed a lot of faith to go to that persecuting guy. And, and you know, and then... There was gifts of healings. All these things are happening at the same time out of one, per, one disciple. You've got that ability within you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then 
I'll be finished in a second here. I don't like that clock. Anyway, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I've destiny to face after this. I mean, give me a break. Anyway, but the key thing in that scripture for me is this. Ananias is on his way to see Saul of Tarsus, and he gets to the house. He gets into Judas's house on the street called Straight. He looks at Saul of Tarsus, and he says, Brother Saul. You see, sometimes fear can hinder the love. And the love of God hit his heart as he went. And he went in the love of God and was ever able to deliver some strong words to Saul of Tarsus about all that God was going to do in his life. Another guy in the Bible, Nehemiah, the miraculous city builder. Are you a city builder? Are you an entrepreneur? Are, you know, are you a builder? We're not those that pull down the doors, we're those that build up. He rebuilt the city wall in 52 days. That was miraculous. Do you know what his name means? Comfort of Yahweh. Comfort of Yahweh. The comforter is here. He'll listen to all your stories and then he'll cut through them and he'll say, go and keep going. There's plenty of people that say to me, when are you retiring so we can play golf every day and all that sort of stuff? When he tells me to stop going. And he's not going to tell me to stop going. He's going to tell me to keep going. The same as he tells you. Could you stand to your feet with me today? We've got teams uh, to minister to you this morning and they're going to come and we're going to prophesy over you if necessary what you need today. Is there a lady here called April? If April is in the room, could you come and stand at this side here? I want to prophesy over you. And there's a lady called May, and I think May is your hyphenated name, and it's the second part of your hyphenated name, and I think that God wants to speak to you as well because... Um, I believe he's got something he wants to speak into your life today. So just come if that's you here. And come today and receive. If you need a word from the Lord, we're here to give that word to, of the Lord to you in Jesus' name. We're here to bless you. We're here to encourage you. We're here to motivate you into the next thing that God has for us. Because we're going to do it together. Say that word with me together. Yeah. That's where we're going, together. And that's how we're going, we're going together. So come and let God bless you this morning. Let me pray. There's some entrepreneurs, some city builders in here, and I want to release, just lift your hands, I want to release upon you that Nehemiah anointing for building. If you're open to receive it, receive it now in Jesus' name as we release the power of God in upon your life, your business, your work, the school that you work in, the, the hospital that you work in, and the places that you go, that you will be building and building strong in the comfort and in the grace of God that He's called you to walk in in these days in Jesus' name. I'll give you a prophetic word. Come receive what God has for you today in Jesus' name.